Well, it's finally happened. Your meme collection has gotten so large that you're no longer able to fit it on individual hard drives and you've decided to upgrade to a dedicated NAS. Now, you've done your research and you've come to the decision that a Synology system would be easy and get you everything you need. But one of your nerdy friends was like, actually, for the same price, you could build your own and get much better performance. And not wanting to look like a total jock, that's the route you've chosen. So you've done more research and found that there's actually quite a few NAS solutions you can go with, specifically NAS-based operating systems. And there's a lot out there, but the one I'm gonna be looking at today is Open Media Vault. I actually did a video similar to this on Unraid. If you wanna check that out, the uh, link is up here, but this is gonna be a first impressions video. I've used it for a total of probably less than 24 hours total. So this isn't really a giant walkthrough, a giant how to of how to do all the fancy things in Open Media Vault. This is my first impressions experience. And honestly, I'm now running it as my main backup server OS. So let's talk about it. So like I mentioned before, Open Media Vault is a NAS-based operating system built upon Debian Linux. So nothing too crazy. You can either install it directly onto a custom-built server, or you can virtualize it within a hypervisor like I've done. But that's for another video, and we're going to stick strictly to Open Media Vault and what it allows you to do. So I went with Open Media Vault 5.6.13. As of right now, um, Open Media Vault 6 is out, but I think the most stable version is still technically 5.6, so that's what I went with. And just like all other hypervisors and NAS-based operating systems, you're gonna get a dedicated web GUI to manage your entire system. And another cool thing about Open Media Vault that is not really a thing on other hypervisors or NAS-based operating systems is that it'll actually run on a Raspberry Pi. So maybe that's useful for you, maybe not, but now you know. Now, before we dive into my setup, I want to talk about the install process, first of all. And this was honestly the worst part of Open Media Vault. The install process was not great. And talking with people in chat of my live stream where I did it, link is up here. A lot of people have had the same issues. Uh, the main one is that by default, it tries to use IPv6 to configure a network connection to get an IP address. And unless you've gone into your router and disabled IPv6, it's not going to work. It just hangs and doesn't proceed with the installation. I even went into my PFSense router and disabled IPv6 and it still wouldn't work. The only way I figured out how to do this and I've had to do this twice in two installations is while it's doing the IPv6 network configuration, physically unplug the cable and wait a second and then plug it back in. From there, uh, one time it let me proceed and do a manual network configuration. The second time it actually used a regular DHCP to get an IP address. So why that's a thing, why you can't just manually select how you wanna configure your network connection in the beginning of the install is beyond me, but that's a terrible, terrible install experience. And even after I got it working, there was another time where the bootloader didn't install all the way before finishing. So even when I rebooted, it was still telling me I didn't have everything installed. What? What, what the hell is this? So yeah, the install process is not great, but you can get it installed. It just is a headache. So let's dive into my setup here. You can see the home screen. And first thing right off the bat is that Open Media Vault is not going to win any prizes for being the best looking operating system on the block. I would put it up there with Proxmox as being uh, down at the bottom tier of the GUI being not very inviting compared to something like Unraid where it's extremely open, extremely inviting. Everything's laid out really nicely, but honestly, it doesn't matter as long as you can get stuff done. I don't really consider that a high priority. Another thing you'll notice is that when you go to your home, it is just a list of settings as opposed to a lot of other hypervisors or operating systems where your home is a dashboard that gives you a bunch of stats on your system and a lot of useful information. This isn't really like that, but again, not a huge deal. But I do like the settings layout. Everything is 
kind of laid out nice and neat for you. It's not overly intimidating. Everything is clear and concise. If you want to do something, it's neatly labeled for you. So let's walk through uh, from top to bottom some of the settings and some of the setups that I've done and I'll give you my impressions. So going through your system settings is pretty straightforward. You have general settings, not too much in there. Basically change the port of the web GUI, network configurations, notifications if you'd like to set up, Open Media Vault to send you emails on certain tasks, then you can set that up here pretty easy. Just enter your STMP information for your mailbox and it will use that to send emails. Over here in certificates, you can add SSL certificates or SSH certificates. SSL, if you wanna do HTTPS on your server, you can simply add one here or you can import one. And then when you add one, it's super easy to do. Enter your information, hit save, and then your server will be self-signed and be able to use HTTPS SSL. Scheduled jobs, obviously it is what it says it is. It's scheduled jobs. You can add them in here and have them perform a certain command every X number of minutes, hours, days, whatever you want. Basically a cron job. Plugins, now this is something, again, that's not as robust as other hypervisor OSs or NAS-based operating systems like TrueNAS, Unraid, even Proxmox. Um, it's kind of lacking. You can find more online, obviously, and it's not really, again, a common theme, not super inviting, but there's basic stuff here you can get done. You can either, there's even a ZFS plugin if you wanna use ZFS, we'll get to the file systems in a bit, but you can scroll through here, there's basic stuff. This is built on Debian, remember, so, Anything that you can run in Debian, you'll be able to run in Open Media Vault, but we're gonna be focusing more on the functionality out of the box itself and what you can do in the GUI rather than tweaking stuff behind the scenes. Cause obviously I know it's based on Debian. Anything you can do in Debian, you can do in here. So yeah, but that's not what this is about. And OMV Extras, that's actually a plugin that I installed or a, is it even a plugin? It's an add-on, but I will touch on that in a bit. So yeah, general settings for the system neatly laid out, easy to understand. Let's move on to the actual meat and potatoes of a NAS operating system and the storage. So in storage, there's a few little tabs, uh, disks, we'll list the disks, obviously. Here you can see I have a dedicated 100 gigabyte boot drive that is running my Open Media Vault virtual machine. And I've passed through three 14 terabyte uh, hard drives, and you can see them listed here. So honestly, not much here, just showing your disks and make sure they are available in Open Media Vault. Under there, we have smart settings, and if you care about this, um, monitoring smart errors and uh, temperatures or anything like that, you can enable that here and have scheduled tests set up and have it email you on those tests. I haven't set any of that up yet. Again, I'm like a day into Open Media Vault. So yeah. Open Media Vault people out there, feel free to comment on any tips and tricks that I should know about um, that I may not have covered in this video, but uh, we will keep going on. Now, RAID management is the main thing that I wanna to touch on. So Open Media Vault uses the default levels of RAID. You can pick between RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, I believe RAID 6, RAID 10. I went with a RAID 5 on my three 14 terabyte drives now. I can hear the people saying, oh, RAID 5 on 14 terabytes, you're not supposed to use over four terabytes. Oh my God. Chill, this is my backup system. It'll be all right. So on stream, when I was setting this up, I hit create, I gave it a name, I selected RAID 5, I picked my three 14 terabyte drives, I hit create, and it was telling me that it was going to take 20 hours to complete. How we doing? How we doing? Oh yeah, we're almost at 1%. Let's go. Gotta take a sip at every 1%. Woo! It had to do a complete clean and resync of all the drives. And it ended up actually taking 36 hours. 36 hours. So if you plan on setting this up and you have large drives or want to do RAID, then allocate a good amount of time for the cleaning and resyncing of those drives because yeah, it's gonna take a while. So after my RAID configuration was finally ready to go, I went into file systems and that is where I could set up an actual file system on my brand new RAID array. So here you can see out of the three 14 terabyte drives, we got a total usable space of 25.47 terabytes, which, you know, that's to be expected. 
And you can see I configured mine to use ButterFS. You can configure it in many different ways. The default options are in here. You can use ButterFS, ext3 or 4, uh, F2FS, XFS, JFS. Uh, there's even a plugin if you want to use ZFS, but uh, I went with ButterFS. It's a pretty solid file system all around. So that's what I chose to go with. So once you have this set up, you technically have a NAS built and you have a large file system that can contain all your memes, all your homework, and um, you're done. Not really. I'm sure you wanna do a good bit more with your NAS setup, especially with sharing. So let's talk about that. So let's skip over access rights management just for a second and go down to services. This is where you'll set up your shares because what good is an ass if you can't access it over your network? So the default options they have here, you can set up an NFS share, or you can do Samba, which is my preference. I use Samba for all my shares. If you wanna use something else, you can. You can also set up an FTP here as well, but let's go into Samba and take a look. So you're gonna to wanna to enable it. You can give it a work group or just leave it default. And you're gonna to wanna to go over to this tab called shares. Now here you can see I've set up three different ones and it's extremely easy to do. Just click add, enable, go over here. If it's a new one, click add, give it a name, select a device. We only have one if you have multiple file systems set up or multiple devices. Uh, you can pick them here, but we only have one file system on our main RAID array, so we will pick that. And by default, it will set a root path you can change this if you want, just manually enter you know, the path that you want this to be mounted to. Permissions, I just leave it default. Obviously everybody's use case is different. And then hit save. Then when you scroll down, you'll see a bunch of basic settings for Samba, give it a comment, public, uh, if you want guest access to it. Browsable, this is basically if you want it to be discovered on the network and to be able to browse the file system. Uh, time machine support, inherit ACLs, and hair permissions. This gets into permissions and ACLs, obviously, which I'm not super versed at. So I'll leave it to the permissions and ACL experts there. Uh, recycle bin, that's cool. If you want to enable a recycle bin on your share, where, you know, obviously it's like a recycle bin. If something gets deleted, it can be recovered later. You can set settings for that here. And a couple of more settings. Host allow if you want only specific devices to access the share. You can enter their IPs here or a complete uh, list of subnets. So this is useful if you wanna block certain subnets or VLANs in your network from accessing certain shares. And then once you have that, click save. Oh, and an open media vault, anytime you make a change, uh, this banner is going to uh, hit you up and ask for a nice little apply. So get used to that. Oh yeah, and then once you hit apply, uh, it asks, do you really want to apply? Okay, so we have our share, but now we need access to it. And that's where we're gonna step back into our access rights management tab. And from here, it's pretty basic. Uh, you can go in and add users. I've added two here, and then you can also add a group. I have one here called SMB, where it just contains my two users, and I can assign access to my Samba shares on just this group instead of every single user. And going into our shared folders, you'll see a list of our shared folders. And from here, you can click on one and edit privileges or ACL. For basic systems, I would strongly recommend just modifying privileges. It's much easier if you know what you're doing with ACLs, you can certainly go into that. But for the basic needs, just go ahead and edit privileges. Now, here you can see an extremely basic layout when you wanna edit privileges. I don't know why it doesn't separate user accounts from groups, but it does give you this nice little icon to differentiate them. But instead of having to assign read and writes to every single user, I could uncheck these and just assign it to my SMB group, which contains those users. Hit save, apply, yes. And just like that, I should still have access to that directory. So let's go ahead and try it. Credentials. And look at that, we are in, here's our files. We can see what's on here. We can even go in, create our own stuff, bada bing, bada boom. We have a network share. So now technically you have an NAS on your system with a shared directory with access to it and you could stop here, but I didn't. There's a couple more features that I wanna talk about. So let's finish up with those. 
Earlier in the video, I mentioned this OMV Extras plugin or add-on, and it's super easy to install. It's literally one line, and once you run that, it will uh, populate down here under System. And what OMV Extras does is it gives you easy access to a Docker setup, a cockpit setup, and different kernels you can boot from. So that's pretty interesting. The main thing I'm focusing on here is Docker because being able to run Docker is extremely important in my setup. I know it's extremely important in a lot of people's setups and the default orchestrator they use is Portainer. So when you go in here, Docker will not be enabled by default. All you have to do is hit install Docker. It's gonna install Docker, then install Portainer. It's gonna install Portainer. Once that's done, you will see an open Portainer button. Click that and it will take you to your instance of Portainer. And here we are in Portainer running. Now you can see I'm only running one thing, that's sync thing. I'm not gonna talk about sync thing or get into the details of that. That's for a future video where I talk about my complete backup setup and how I upgraded it. But just having Docker on your system is super useful. I recommend anybody who hasn't looked into Docker for their system yet to look into it. It'll make your life a lot easier. There will be some headaches, but they're worth it. Buy some Advil. Now you don't have to go with Portainer if you don't want Docker is installed directly within the host. So you can use CLI if you want, if you're a hardcore mega nerd and just wanna go full CLI on Docker. If you wanna install your own orchestrator, you can do that. But uh, Portainer by default, I use it on my main system. So it's convenient that it's the default on Open Media Vault. So last thing I kinda wanna touch on is that I mentioned before that when you go to home, it's not a dashboard or anything, but there is a dashboard uh, down at the bottom under diagnostics. Click on dashboard and that will give you some stats on your system, system information, services. You can drag them around. You can make them larger. Uh, you can add some things. So if you want to check out your file systems or network interfaces or whatever, you can add that. Um, it's just not the, uh, the nicest or easiest to use dashboard that I've ever seen, which I guess you've heard me say it enough during this video, Open Media Vault isn't the most inviting OS, but again, that's okay. So I guess that covers everything I really wanted to touch on on my first impressions. Uh, overall, what do I think about Open Media Vault? I honestly, I like it. I know it doesn't seem like it from this video that I'm a big fan of it, but I actually chose this to run as my uh, main NAS operating system for my backup server, mainly because of its simplicity. I like how simple and dedicated to being a NAS operating system Open Media Vault is. It doesn't try to do a whole bunch of stuff out of the box, like a lot of hypervisors, especially like Unraid. Now it's not a knock on Unraid. Unraid is a terrific all-in-one system, but I personally just wanted something that was NAS focused and allowed me to run Docker, which Open Media Vault is. I also like the flexibility of it to be able to run on a lot of different systems, including ARM systems like a Raspberry Pi. If you wanna see me do an Open Media Vault setup on the Raspberry Pi, let me know down in the comments. I'd honestly be pretty happy to do that. But yeah, first impressions are that it's good. It's not perfect at all, but it's serving me well for the um, couple of days that I've been using it now. So. Again, this isn't a long-term review. This isn't a deep dive into how to use it. This is first impressions. And I will be making a video later on down the road on my long-term usage as my uh, backup NAS operating system. But yeah, that's all I really have today. I would be interested to know what you're running. Are you running Open Media Vault? Are you running something else? Are you running Unraid? Are you running TrueNAS, Core Scale? Are you running just regular old Linux with some hard drives in it and a manual RAID configuration? Let me know down in the comments. But that's it. If you enjoyed this video, please drop a like below. If you like content like this, please consider subscribing. If you want to hang out and talk about tech and ask some questions and hang out with the RAID Owl community, uh, we do have a Discord, link is in the description below. I also have a link to Patreon if you want to donate to the channel and help further development on projects, you can do that as well. But that is it. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider subscribing and I will see you in the next one.